Uh, no, I appreciate all of you coming, uh, especially those of you who are um, part of our school system and are getting uh, special awards. And we're just so pleased that all of you uh, could be here. And also for the public, we always uh, uh, like uh, the public to be uh, part of our gathering. So uh, again, uh, welcome. Uh, the next thing, we have an agenda. Um, I have a motion to accept the agenda. Make that motion. I yeah, have a motion by Carol Powell, second by Joyce Lockwood. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next thing would be the invocation. Uh, Carol Powell's going to do that. Let's bow our heads please. Father God, we thank you for this day. We ask you to continue to bless our children, our administrators, our faculty, and our families. Help us to continue to make decisions that are pleasing in your sight. Thank you for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now please stand for the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next is the superintendent report. Uh, I echo Chairman Green's uh, welcome tonight. We, uh, as normally do in our regular session, board members, we have some very special guests tonight, some students we'll recognize. Uh, but I will quickly mention a couple of other things that uh, we've dealt with this past week. Uh, one is uh, we have a partnership with Coca-Cola in the district, uh, and Coke, as uh, part of being a Coke <coughs> district, uh, gives us a rebate on any coats that are sold in our concession stands, uh, any of the sales that are done like at the elementary school, uh, they give us a rebate uh, from that, and we got our first quarter's rebate. Uh, it was $1,163. Uh, we will take, and we're uh, prorating that out to the elementary, middle, high, and second chance academies. Uh, those funds will be uh, able to be uh, used for their positive behavior intervention system, not only for students, but also for faculty. So I just wanted to uh, say that um, you get a chance, drink a Coke, and um, it comes back to the district. So it's a great partnership we've developed, and we hope to be able to develop more of those in the future. Uh, we also want to report to the board, uh, Mr. Uh, or Chairman Green and Ms. Boatwright and I completed our annual audit uh, last week, and we sat with the auditors. Uh, we received a commendation and we will, we will be recommended again for the Financial Award of Excellence in Reporting. Uh, we believe we are one of less than, I'm going to say 12, I think there were 12 last year, that has received that distinction since the uh, award uh, began several years back. So uh, I do commend Ms. Boatwright and, and the staff in their uh, compliance with that. There were no audit findings. There are two um, categories that the review looks at. One are audit findings where there are serious breaches of, of, of practice. We had no audit findings. We did have one uh, management letter where it was dealing with uh, oversight and uh, permissions within the state software. But as I have reviewed it with Ms. Buckwright and I shared with the state, there is simply no way for us to change the state's code on PC Genesis. The program is probably 25 years old. Um, in order for Ms. Boatwright to do bank reconciliation, she has to have a code F. Code F, though, is not recommended by the state for financial directors. So it's one of those situations you simply cannot break out the duties because of the coding. So we've noted that. We have internal measures uh, to meet the compliance there. But again, it was an excellent report. Uh, the state has now changed, so there was no... Uh, management letter about our excess fund balance. We believe that is partly due because of the flexibility that school districts are, are, are having now to be able to use those funds uh, to help supplement uh, in particular areas. So I just again want to publicly commend Ms. Buckwright and we will present that again when the certificate comes uh, in the weeks ahead. Having said that, uh, one last thing and then I'll move into our student recognition. This too is student recognition. Ms. Sandra Todd from the Wildlife Club uh, emailed me today and I want to announce to the group that uh, in 2014 the district submitted 59 essays for the wildlife essay competition uh, out of the 409 that were submitted for the entire county. This year we submitted 328 essays of the total 620. 
Uh, so I want to commend our principals, our instructional coaches for really encouraging our kids to get out and compete with their writing. Uh, I understand they had to bring on a lot of additional readers uh, to do that, but it is a tremendous feat. Writing is a very uh, important college and career skill, so we want to say thank you uh, to the students who participated and also to the Wildlife Club for partnering with the district on that academic initiative. So, uh, Having said that, I believe Coach Welch, uh, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. And uh, these guys up here are part of our uh, 3A All-Region team. Uh, Miles Freeman, Holston Robinson, Craig Powell, um, Fat Man, <laughs> Jose Camacho, Ron Taylor, Taki Hines, Kari Benson, uh, Kelson Morgan, and Devon Hayden. These guys all made first and second team uh, all region this year in a very tough region. We finished fourth in the region and we won the last three out of four games. And uh, what happens is that guys in our region, when we have a big region, decided you know, these guys was uh, up to task and they had a great season. And it's always a, a privilege that you have kids that are on those type of teams that represent Clayson High School. And uh, these are our guys that represent Clayson High School football team. <coughs> Track. But since we are in uh, basketball season, and I am a assistant coach and on behalf of Coach Bluestein. We are making the Georgia High School State playoffs. We're number 24. So we're playing. kids uh, to go to college and, and, and my job has always been to have you done all you can for me to push you to the next level and we're very fortunate to have some guys that already have offers and some guys that are pending still working on that. Holson Robinson has offers at Clark University. Uh, Craig Powell, we have University of Charlotte and uh, Clark University that are still pending, they're still evaluating them. And then Kelsey Morgan has uh, University of West Georgia and Albany State that are looking at him as well. And a kid that is not here tonight has been offered a full ride to um, Shorty University is uh, Tyreek Furman. particularly those who've got scholarships. But Coach Welch, I want to tell you a uh, tremendous asset you've been to the district uh, for your leadership with these young men. My son got to play for him, so I saw it firsthand uh, as a parent and as a superintendent. But uh, guys, make sure that you you commend your coaching staff. Thank them for the hard work they do for your teachers because it, it's been a team effort to get you where you are, but that was the opportunity, and you seized the opportunity, and we want to say congratulations. Always represent the black and gold well. And, uh, and keep in touch with home, and when you get that education, come back and contribute to your, your home table. Uh, That's right. We'd love to have you back. So, great job. you to work hard for the next three years for me so we can get some colleges. Well, as we 
we continue to celebrate, uh, Ms. Welch, am I turning it over to you? Um, and a recognition from Paxton Middle School. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I would just like to say thank you for allowing me to coach the girls this year. And I would like to commend them for winning Middle School League Girls Basketball Runner-Up for 2018. All right, I'm going to introduce them. We have Lena Mixie. We have Taylor Mixon, Anaya Smith, Elizabeth Cole, Zariana Harden, Journey Colors, Azaria Dothy, Soraya Johnson, Sanaya Williams, Janacia Love, Kaylee Finley, Elijah Smith, Jamesha Taylor, and Olivia Denton. Yes, I did. <laughs> Um, our final game, we went up against a team of eighth graders, and they only fell short by about seven points. Oh, and we are a team of sixth and seventh graders. Okay. Girls, I'll tell you, Coach Tomlin's already looking towards the future, so. <laughs> Congratulations, great job, but I also want to commend these young ladies. I understand utmost character in representing the school, uh, and we appreciate that, Coach Welch, for the work that you do. Coach Oliver uh, Ms., and Dr. Holland as well for supporting uh, the programs. Webb's family is doing well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> We'll recognize uh, some very special students yes, tonight. I was going to school. We got to get some help though. We're coming visual aids. Yeah. Mr. Charlie, over here, Jason, go next slide. Come on, Karen. We got a couple of us have to pull this thing. And we're taking it. She's got the four times. She's got the four times. Okay. <laughs> about two weeks ago, we had our annual spelling bee at the elementary school. It takes about a week to do it, all the grade levels, kindergarten, all the way through fifth grade. Tonight, we're going to celebrate the fourth and the fifth grade winner out of this uh, competition. And uh, the regional comes up in two two weeks from now on a Saturday, I think it's the 24th, and it's not this Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And we're just really pleased. We'd like to thank Dr. Waters for coming over. He called the words for us and uh, people from the community and uh, Ms. Poole was one of the judges. So it was just a really great day. Now the two, uh, two winners, they went head to head back and forth in here. We were here probably for, I forget how many rounds. Two hours. Two hours. But I'll let, I'm going to let Ms. Anthony introduce our, our winners. And these are all the children that participated. We put these up in the school. We started last year, and they're in our cafeteria. The one from last year, we'll move it to the hallway. And our plan is just to keep going as long as we can afford them. That recognizes the children. We do it for this. Last Saturday, we had math mania. Not change subjects on you, but we did the same thing for math. Academics, I love sports. Gentlemen, you're doing a great job. Ladies, you're doing a great job. We have to we have to celebrate academics too. Yeah. And today, that's what we're at here today. So um, we're just really pleased with the outcome of this. And two great children won it. So go ahead, Ms. Hanson. Uh, we call it the Super Bowl of spelling because they battled and battled and battled. And like I said, we were here for over two hours with them spelling words. And so we have our runner up with us today. This is Joshua Lynch. He's a fourth grader. And he's competing for the first year. Our top speller is Cadence Allred, but um, she has the flu, so I'm told. So she's not here tonight, but hopefully she'll be better in two weeks when it's time to compete at the regional competition. So we're really proud of both.
<laughs> well, I'll have to confess, uh, Miss Anthony asked me to be the word caller, and I was more than happy to do it. And I know that uh, Joshua and Cadence were nervous, and I, I think they went, what, six or seven rounds. <laughs> they were so nervous, but I told Miss Poole one time, I said, I've got to get up, and I was so tense. I mean, it was, it was worse than watching Georgia at the last minute. <laughs> Congratulate the mother, too. But that's right. <laughs> All right. Great job, and Mr. Major, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's about academics, it's about fine arts, it's about character, it's about athletics, uh, it's about um, the Plaxton City. We want to represent the district well in all of these areas, and we uh, commend you again, young men and women, parents and the community for supporting us in our efforts to educate the whole child, but also to make sure they're ready for college and career. That's why we're here. And uh, it's, a, it's a joy to be able to open our meetings and celebrate the success of our students and our, and our faculty as well. So, do you want to give a uh, break? Well, I don't know if you want to give a break for folks that made it yeah. stage. Oh, yeah. 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 Sure, I'm not sure if our kids Yeah, we're going to wait a little bit. A little short recess. Uh, any of you who just came to pick up your awards is great. We're glad that you came to give you a nice opportunity for everybody to speak to you as well. And then we'll reconvene in about five minutes. Okay. <laughs>
do have a person who's going to participate tonight. Uh, let me just read you the rules. The public may address the Board of Education certain issues other than specific student or individual matter. It's anticipating the public participation segment of the meeting. Please sign in on the public participation sign-in sheet located entrance to the boardroom, 530. Uh, a three-minute uh, time limit will be imposed for each speaker. A timer will be set. Please conduct uh, your remarks uh, when directed by the board chair. Your cooperation in this matter will be appreciated. No speaker shall indulge in personal attacks while speaking. All comments are to be addressed directly to the Board of Education. Personnel concern may be addressed in writing to the superintendent or chairman of the Board of Education. So, uh, Mr. Robert Hudson, uh, may speak. Yes, sir. It's really to get back to the principle about selling the property. I've never been in a town where we have access to three buildings that we're going to get rid of. Uh, the issue is, last couple of meetings we've had, I think around November, December time frame when everything got heated up, you said we need to remodel the old or the new elementary school that's out on 301. I think you guys are asking for like seven or ten million dollars to renovate the new building. Well now, look at what we got here. Everything's in disarray over here. We never did anything to these buildings here. Before you got here, the last superintendent, nothing got done. Now nothing's getting done over here, and you guys are wanting $10 million to go through there and do that building. So are you guys going to let that property where Mr. Midget is the principal of getting the shape that these buildings are, and then what are we going to do, build another building? Because the last couple of meetings we had, you guys said that we could move a new school closer to 301 when it's time to build another building. Why are we keep building buildings when we keep fix, no kids in here, the buildings that we already got? Anybody got a question? May I address her? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hodgson, I, I think there might be some, some misinformation as far as the amount of monies. We actually earned uh, $1.7 million through state capital outlay Roger. for the renovation of Plaxton Elementary School. Right. We discovered that when we began the conversation about our facilities plan for the new Claxton High School. And it was certainly advised to us the board took the opportunity to seize those dollars and it has no impact on the dollars we earned for the high school. So it's two separate products. But to, to answer your question, to fully renovate Claxton Elementary School to a brand new, as if you walk into a brand new building, would cost an approximate $7 million. Why are we waiting to it costs $7 million to renovate it. Why won't we fix it before it breaks? Right. Well, and that's, that's what we're saying. $7 million would be a complete, as if it were a brand new building, it's 25 years old. We don't have the $7 million to do it all at one clip. The board is looking at appropriating around $2 million with the local commitment and the state monies. And we're actually looking for the board to make a decision tonight on a contract manager to help us lead through that process to, to get as much done as we can with the $2 million. At that point, the board is going to work, or we're going to work with the board to establish a long-term maintenance program where we're keeping that building and addressing the immediate needs. Now, when we say $7 million, that includes new paint, new flooring, new windows, new doors. Some of those things don't need to be done. Painting, for example, could be done internally with our maintenance department. So that would be part of the issue that we would save that money by doing it locally. So there's not a need to, to spend $7 million. That's if we wanted as a district to have a building that looked like a brand new, state-of-the-art building top to bottom. But going to implement a maintenance program is one thing, but you had board members here before you got here that could address this with a prior superintendent that didn't do nothing. And I, I can't answer that. I know that you can't answer it. You're just at the realm now. But we are looking, and the board is being proactive in that and very supportive of that, that we develop long-range plans as part of the strategic plan, that we do maintain the facilities. As far as the properties here, and I think that's another, um, it's misinformation, and the average citizen wouldn't know this, but the way the state outlays money, we get money for initial buildings. For example, if we get ready to build a new high school, there'll be approximately six million dollars of state monies that can partner with our monies to build a new high school. 
About 12 years after construction, we earned monies for upgrading HVAC because the units uh, were out. And about 25 years into the life of a building, we get the monies like we're getting at elementary school. And it's not going to be a full turn it into a state-of-the-art brand new school. It's going to be a portion to address roofing, HVAC, lighting, and things of that nature, which we're doing. The board has, we got to work with the board to put together a long-range plan. It was not here. Um, and so what's the proposal on flat top? Have we already got it appraised to sell? No, so the board's actually going to take that item up in just a few minutes. Okay. So I, I okay. and, and I think I, we can further explain that once we get there. Uh, well, I can tell you this, so we have done some stuff at that elementary school for now that uh, wasn't a major project, but we've replaced, you know, some flooring and, uh, you know, carpet and all kinds of things like that, the flooring in the gym, some uh, HVAC units, so it, it hasn't just been left to fall and look like that over there because that's 50 years old over there, so it's a big difference. It's also well, I know, well, what I was we're getting back to the barracks that they built at Fort Stewart in the 60s. They were only supposed to last 20 years, but they didn't. They lasted 40, 50 years. They looked brand new. The barracks that me and Mr. Midget went through during basic training, they looked brand new as the day they built them back in the 60s. They still look the same back then as they did today. But the federal government has a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's all. We have a maintenance program. We won't and, get into it tonight. And, and we, we're, we're working on it. Okay. We're working on it. We appreciate that. <coughs> All right. The next thing is all business for approval. Construction manager. Uh, speaking of construction, uh, this is an item that was brought to the board, I believe, in November. Uh, just for the, the public's understanding of where we are, uh, as Mr. Hodgson mentioned, we're looking at capturing a, about $1.7 million from state monies to upgrade and uh, modify and renovate is the term, the elementary school. There's a local commitment of about $210,000 to partner with that in order to earn all of those state funds. We've asked the board and we went through a process uh, with Mr. Parker uh, of looking at different options to handle the construction or renovation process. There are five models in the state, but two that are primarily identified for uh, educational systems. Those are either a design bid build process, uh, and a design bid build simply means we get the architect to draw it, we put it out to bid. Uh, and we take bids on lighting, we take bids on masonry, we take bids on electrical. And when you get those bids, the design bid build concept is you are mandated to take the lowest bidder. The downside to design bid build is that you may or may not know that a vendor or a contractor has the capability to meet your timeline or the quality. There is no oversight, it's simply the lowest bid. We're getting into an era, particularly with technology and safety and things like that, when you build, unfortunately, the cheapest, sometimes that's exactly what we wind up with, and we spend more long term than we do in the short term. Because of that, the state has adopted a new model uh, about five years ago. Uh, it's my understanding from Mr. Parker, about 85% of the projects in the state of Georgia are using this model, and it's called a construction manager at risk. Uh, the board has approved for us to use this process, and the difference is a construction manager at risk comes in to oversee our product or our project. This construction manager has the legal ability to then negotiate with the bids or reject bids if he or she finds out that they are a subpar contractor or they're using subpar materials or if they are finding out that they cannot meet their timelines that they're required to meet. So there's a negotiating factor. When you look over the five years, you've got basically a break-even point when you look at cost because a contractor, uh, construction manager risk, there is a percent they charge for their services. But on the other hand, you've got contingencies that are built in that if you run over contingencies in design bid build, you're just adding the cost. The construction manager at risk, his job is to mitigate to make sure we're not dipping into contingency funds by, by negotiating and mitigating those when we take in the, um, the bids for the different areas. The process required us to advertise for 30 days. We have to do that in the state. Uh, local Oregon is the terminology there. 
Uh, that's a DOE requirement. It was due January the 16th of uh, this year at about 3 p.m. Uh, and then we have a review committee. Uh, Chairman Green represented the board. Uh, I represented the district office. Ms. Boatwright served there. Mr. Tommy Hendricks is uh, one of our facilities and maintenance uh, crew. Uh, he has actually previous experience in commercial and residential contracting. And of course, Mike Parker is the architect. We went through a series of, uh, of a rubric and grading everything from the experience contractors had in actually building schools and renovating schools uh, to timelines. Did they have the staff to meet? Uh, we're, we're looking at a short summer timeline on some of the portions of the project. Uh, we looked at then one of the, the, there were nine, I believe Mr. Chairman is correct, there were nine areas that we reviewed. Each person independently scored and then we added the scores together and came up with a ranking. The last score also dealt with the percent fee uh, for their services and also the contingency they estimated for the project. Uh, as we went through that process, uh, we shared with the board at the last meeting, there were five companies, uh, there are the nine areas over on the right hand side. There were five companies that submitted uh, requests uh, or for proposal. Hope Construction, TQ Contractors, Incorporated, Dabs Williams, General, Lavender and Associates, Incorporated, Lynn Construction. And when we ranked those individuals, uh, Pope Construction became the, uh, the top ranking uh, submittal, I guess you would say. And uh, I will tell the community, as I told the board, we investigated the top two. Uh, there was a distinct mark between those two scores. Uh, I've contacted several superintendents that have used both firms, and both firms, both public construction and TQ contractors, came highly recommended, uh, highly competent in dealing with the schools uh, and the type of project we have, and in meeting their timeline. So, based on that information, uh, it is our recommendation from the committee that we go with public construction, who ranked uh, the highest on that rubric uh, as our construction manager at risk. Having made that recommendation, are there any other questions then that I can answer for the board? Question. There, there was some confusion. I want to make sure I state this: that we were hiring a person to oversee the projects. The construction manager at risk actually is a firm. Uh, in every case here, they actually will have a team of associates that will come in and work with the district. All of them would have. Uh, Pope is no different. You'll have a person that will come over and deal with estimating the project cost. Uh, you'll have a job superintendent that will be the person on site every day. Uh, you will have a construction manager lead person. Uh, in the case with Pope Construction, the gentleman's name is Jeff Pope. Um, you have a designer. Uh, there's, so there's a team assembled that will address the project uh, as we move forward. Is that team a member of the contractors that would be awarded the bid? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. The construction manager at risk will actually negotiate the bids, but none of their workers would be subcontractors. No, ma'am. That, that's a very good question. These are actually employed by public construction, so they would not be subcontractors. That doesn't mean they couldn't use any local <coughs> contractors here to do part of the work. That is correct. And that's one of the things that once we recommend the board approves a contract with construction manager risk, we can have a conversation by saying we wish as a board to use as much local labor. And that was one of the areas you'll look at item six, local participation plan. Uh, we specifically asked that that be included. So that was one of the requests that we would make of, of the uh, manager. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to accept Pope Construction Company as our RFP construction manager at risk? We have a motion by Pope Guterres. Do I have a second? By Ed Mosley. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? By the motion carries. Okay. Okay. I'll do it. Okay. Uh, the next is old business table uh, declaration of surplus property. I, I think this will help to answer Mr. Hodgson's question. Um, I certainly want to attempt to do so. 
I, I just remind the board this is still uh, a table item, so if the board wishes tonight to move forward uh, with declaration of surplus, we would need a motion to take action on this, and then a motion, I was talking about Rick, to move it to an action item, and then a motion to accept the action item, is that correct? Um, but if the board wishes for it to remain tabled for us to gather additional information, again, we emphasize to the board there's not really a deadline per se. Uh, we want to make sure that we're moving in the right direction and take the time to do so. Uh, at the last meeting, the board asked us to advertise it in the paper. We did so, and also uh, we sent the information to Ms. Lodge in Lowell, Georgia. Um, we requested if anybody had questions or comments, they could email me or write a letter. Um, I received one letter from Ms. Linda Edwards that I gave you all in your packet tonight. I wanted to make sure that we went on record and shared that, that uh, her comments were uh, given to you. Uh, I did not receive any other emails or, or, or letters, uh, so I just wanted to let the board know that uh, to date. What we've asked the board to do is to take into consideration a declaration of surplus property. Uh, there are five parcels of property uh, that we've asked the board to consider. Uh, Mr. Hodgson, you had mentioned, uh oh, Ron, I'm sorry, which one of these is the laser? The metal, the circle? The middle one. Okay. Um, Mr. Hodgson mentioned the flat top building. That is actually what we're referring to as parcel two, which is, as most folks refer to it, the flat top building. It's the old pre K building. And it is this piece of property here. There's a parking lot uh, that's adjacent to that building. Um, and I believe that Stewart Street, if I'm correct, Highway 280, uh, North College, and this is uh, West James Street on the backside there. So this is one parcel that we've asked the board to consider surplusing. Uh, what that means is the building no longer is in our physical inventory. We cannot use that building according to a state code. It's been phased out. We don't earn any additional state monies, and currently for us to retain this property, is an annual liability insurance cost and any maintenance that we do to the property or building itself just for safety or security. Um, there's also a parcel number four, uh, which is right here across the street. I think it used to be a parking, I mean, a, a, a street guard, crossing guard, um, sorry, over here, <laughs> a, a crossing guard station, but it's uh, right next to Mr. Hallman's office. Um, We've asked them for that consideration. And then three parcels that are here behind the parking lot at the high school. Uh, these at one point in time were residential par uh, residential lots, uh, as actually most of our property on this side of town are actually parceled out in residential lots. Uh, those pieces of property, again, are not currently used in any fashion by the school system. Uh, and there's no intention in the next uh, 20, 25 years with our facilities plan and moving the high school out there for those properties to be expanded. Some folks have said, well, why don't we look at these properties back here? Well, we're currently still using these for track and soccer. It doesn't mean that if the board wishes at some point in time for us to surplus additional properties, that we could do it. We just logistically would have to move some programs, and that could be done. If the board decides to surplus these five pieces of property or any of the five pieces of property, I want to make sure the public is aware that in doing so, we would then determine a marketing plan. Uh, we have no prospects on the table. There are no deals to be made. We simply would decide uh, as part of that process, uh, I would recommend, and again, it's the board's decision, but we have talked about having it surveyed properly, having it appraised properly, and then determining, are we going to market this internally, meaning that our office would do uh, the sales and notification through local media and online, or would the board want us to entertain uh, uh, a request or pro proposal and have folks to bid on handling that property? Um, again, our policy is very specific. We have to have a declaration of surplus, and then the board would direct us on a marketing plan. So there's not, and then finally, the board would have to approve any contract that is presented uh, in that in that realm. So any questions from the board members or any additional information? I, I will tell you that Melissa McClendon and I spoke today and uh, their company has offered uh, their services as well as uh, they, uh, if we happen to go to an auction type thing, 
they do have a person who uh, has handled uh, the uh, uh, property in Hagen, uh, the, the Schumann property over there. The last one they did for us was the Schumann estate. Right, <clears throat> right. And uh, so I did want to let the, the board know that, that that is one of the possibilities when we get to that point if we make these surpluses. But, you know, we could elicit their help. Yes, sir. Mr. Waters, question. You're talking about that property uh, where you had the bonfires? There used to be a house there? No, sir. Actually, the bonfires, Mr. Hodgson, were right back here on this piece of property. The ones we're talking about are right here, and I apologize for shaking. I haven't had supper. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Number 19 is where that bonfire is. I'm sorry. Yeah, bonfire is 19. Yes, sir. Bonfire is right here at 18 and 19 on that corner. That's okay, right. now where's the student high school park lot at? It's right here. I believe that's number 15 right here. This is student parking. Okay, and that's where, that, where that purple aerial is. This is, uh, that, that's Better Highway. That's correct. Okay, there used to be a house right there. Yes, sir. The house was actually destroyed right. after the property was acquired. That was my understanding. Why did we buy the property if we weren't going to use it? I mean, you, you're, you're I'm asking the board. I, I'm not going to ask you. I'm asking the board. Why did we buy all this property if we weren't going to use it? Because I was told we were going to use it for a parking lot for the high school kids. I, I was here during that time as an educator, and Mr. Griner was a very much an investor, and he made, and the board at that time, which most of them have passed away, was always thought that we would be here. We would always be right here in this area. So he purchased all the surrounding property. I think I believe I'm right. He didn't purchase it. You all did. No, sir, I wasn't. I was a, I no, wasn't involved in. Good. And I don't attack you, sir. Please. So where the bonfire is, is that property going to come up for sale too? It's not in this current consideration. Not in this consideration. No, sir. Again, that is, we still have the track and the soccer teams that are using that after school. So there's a there's a viable use. Uh, but at some point in time, when the high school is constructed on the middle school site, then there's a possibility the board is going to have to decide what they do with that. Now, and I will answer Ms. Lockwood's uh, question. Someone, and I'm not sure who submitted this question earlier, asked about the, the, the acquisition of property that you just uh, that you just acquired of. And Ms. Uh, Amy, a few weeks back, I had her go back and look at the acquisition of property. Most of these properties were purchased between 1955 and 1980. So it was well before... Well, I know the house was there when I moved here in 96. And I lived over here on 80th Street when the house was still there. And the superintendent before you said that they were going to extend the park lot for the kids for the high school. Well, hell, we can't even fill the parking lot up that we got now with cars for the kids because we don't have that many high school kids. And, and Mr. Hodgson, I was simply saying, I, I, I welcome the conversation. If you'd like to come by and sit down sometime for us okay. to talk. I, I think the whole issue that the board is trying to do now, um, and that has been the directive for our staff, is that we want to put together a plan to take these properties that right now are costing us to maintain and insure and turn those into capital that we can address the needs of the elementary school and the high school. Uh, and I, I think the board is being very proactive in that stance. I'll make a point to come see you. Sure. Okay. All right. Any questions? Does the board have a, a desire to surplus the properties or to consider yes. tabling whatever you want to do? All right, I think we've we had this on the table for months. Yeah. We've asked for input from outside sources, inside sources. It's not getting any better. It's not looking any better. It's not helping the communities. It's time. Yes. And I think the concern that I've heard from the few folks that I've talked with is that they want the board to be sensitive to who we sell the property to. And I would simply say, I think the board, the desire has been that we do as best we can, but it's like any other piece of property. Once we declare it and once it's sold, then we, we certainly wouldn't govern those individuals. But uh, the uh, I think you'll need the two motions, Mr. Chairman. You'll need a motion to move this from a table item to an action item. You'll need a proper motion in a second, and then once that's approved, you'll need a motion then to surplus. I, I do want to address the letter, but I heard you address everything that has been instructed in this case. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Okay, so I don't, do I have a motion to move the uh, uh, decoration of surplus property uh, 
from a table item to an action item. Second, Mr. Chair. Have a motion by Chair Hare, second by Joyce Lockwood. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. Now, I have a motion to declare that for the declaration of surplus property um, to approve the declaration of that surplus property. Okay, motion by Sharon Hare, second by Paul Gutierrez. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. So we now declare the surplus property um, surplus and we'll proceed with a marketing plan from here. And of course, what we will do is we'll gather uh, several options then on the marketing plan, put that before the board to consider, uh, and then you can give us some direction on that process. Thank you. All right, the next would be new business consent agenda, which includes board minutes from January 8th, the regular board meeting at 6 o'clock, the January 22nd uh, board meeting at 6 o'clock, the uh, board member payroll for January 2018, finance for December 2017 financial report, and some personnel recommendations um, that have been uh, disclosed to us. Um, and Ms. Boatwright. Ms. Boatwright. Yes, sir. Our principals, our administrators, and district folks have looked very closely at what's necessary 
uh, and we're watching those expenditures very closely. And I think we said today we're right at $800,000 of cutting out um, expenditures. And I, I say that with reservation because somebody pointed out when well, your expenditures have gone up. We also had an increase of state, a 2% state raise, that revenues went up. So, But on an annual operating basis, we've cut out $800,000 worth of annual expenses. So that is a tremendous feat. Uh, and it, a lot of that credit goes to Mr. Biden, to the staffs at school and working with us. I can't make this comment. Uh, the auditors were very complimentary of what we have done and the way we do it. And we even discussed uh, about the management letter. Uh, a new uh, software program that cost about a quarter of a million dollars to implement. And uh, for example, and I think this has already been mentioned, but in order for Allison to get to one part of it, she has to go to be able to get through all of it. It won't allow her to jump from one area to another. So, uh, and there's no way she could do her job without that. So they, even though they wrote us a management letter, they understood the situation uh, and they were very complimentary. And we talked about uh, uh, the new hire, uh, Casey. Um, I'm trying to remember the last one. Hodges. Hodges, Hodges now, okay. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, she was doing a very good job, and Allison was very complimentary of that, and, and that uh, auditor was very impressed that, you know, that we had taken steps to try to improve, uh, you know, our, our deficiencies in that area. We do take very seriously what they tell us, and we try to implement accounting controls along the way. Um, I, I tell about the words, sometimes I feel like when you do a good job, then it's just open it up and then look for something else. So, um, we're all, we have a good working relationship with them, and we're very receptive to um, helpful uh, advice they give us and doing whatever we can to implement accounting controls. Um, that's that is an important thing so that we cover ourselves. And by the way, they did call me in December and just ask me uh, what my take was on, on, on the finances and how we were doing and you know if I had any things that I needed to make them aware of and all that. So you know I have been in dialogue with them not just at this meeting but all along and along all the way through this process. Okay. Are there any questions about the general funds? We'll turn to the next page, and I don't know if it's just getting older, and I've made the view a lot bigger, but it's now two pages. I'm not sure how I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really know that you may, I may have one thing. I think I just didn't do um, So I apologize for that. Fund 309, uh, the top, this is where we report our SWAS receipts. Um, as of December 31st, we have recognized SWAS revenue of $497,797.67. Um, that's approximately $94,000, $95,000 per month for SWAS. Um, our interest earned $747.13 in our SWAS bank account. Um, you will notice, I believe I tried to explain this last time, the transfers out. Um, the transfers out are going to the individual SPLOS funds, and so you'll see transfers in in those funds. And that's basically just um, so that we can take the revenue where it's recorded as a three on revenue and move it to the applicable funds where we have expenditures. Okay? Um, looking through those, I think the only thing that we may have some um, changes in is Fund 316, Technology Equipment Purchases. Um, we got $75,068.88 there. And fund 317, $38,026.46. Um, we turn to the next page. Our spot for the textbook, $75,480.13 there. And um, I believe that's it for the changes. Fund um, 200 at the bottom, debt service fund. I don't know that there were any changes in this financial report. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. If not, if you'll turn to the next page, especially if you have any Okay. Um, I did change this a little bit. Um, the first big change um, will be that the school food financial report will be presented by Dr. Blocker. So I pulled that line item, one line for that on this report. So I pulled that off so that she can present the school food financial report. But I did um, just let you know which ones are the federal special revenue funds are sitting on the left and which ones are the state. 
Um, I did add a couple of those grants, Connection for Classroom Grant, we have Round 2 funds and Round 3 funds. We have to keep up with those separately. So I added those approved budget amounts, and you'll see that those have been expended in full, and that was funded by the state. Other than that, if you'd like to look through and see if you have any questions about anything, I'd be glad to attempt to answer it. Any questions for Ms. Wentworth? Check register follows if you have any questions about that. If not, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Whitwright uh, mentioned we, uh, as an effort uh, to not only highlight our directors and the jobs they do, but for transparency, we want to make sure that the community is, is uh, aware of, of everything that goes on. We've asked Dr. Blocker to share her financial report, and all of that's ever been done. Uh, and she's also going to share on a monthly basis the regular meetings on her finance for the participation rates for our breakfast and, uh, and lunch programs. And uh, again, we just want to make sure we're getting out the positive news of the good work that's going on. So, Dr. Blocker, if you'll. Did you? Did you have a check question? Have a check question? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't know we were there again. <laughs> <laughs> what, 6%? Zero, 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 I think it's um, things at the high school that were purchased. Um, it's whiteboards okay. and dry erase boards that were purchased for the high school, I believe. Okay, and I have a question about, I know that I'm not, you know, but when I see chapter 13, you know what I think of. Well, so I, I want to know what chapter 13 trustee Savannah Chapter 13 is. would be, um, it means that somebody's paycheck um, is being deducted for um, something that they owe. For some bankruptcy issues, so it's nothing that we pay. It would be a deduction out of someone's got a gross paycheck. Uh, an employee? Yes, we We don't have rules about that. Um, we possibly do, but I mean, if we have we have people that are garnished and things like that. Lots of those are garnishments, maybe, and they're having to pay back on the money. I'll check on that, Mr. We had a rule about that when I was employed by the school system. I'll double check. That's right. Thank you. And Allen's Electrical and Plumbing. What check number is that? Uh, 064852. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the toilet in the back hallway here. But I mean, is it a local person? Is my, uh, my question. But, no, ma'am. Allen's is out of state. Um, it's a we don't have a local person that we could get to do that? It's not to do what we had done. Uh, I'll tell you what that one actually was. Uh, Mr. Hendricks attempted, we've got a toilet in this back hallway that uh, evidently when the building was remodeled several years uh, back, there was a tie-in issue um, with drainage. And every once in a while, we have a severe backup issue. Uh, Mr. Hendricks actually replaced the toilet. We had a couple of, I think we had a couple of local folks come out and take a look at it. We actually had to have it scoped they had to descale. That's right. They had to go through and descale. I'm well. not being negative. I just think that, like, Rusty Palmer or someone that's a local person, if we can use them, uh, sir. I certainly want us to do so. And, 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 and we do, Ms. Joyce. I'm not trying to We do, but what I was saying is, in this case, they could not do uh, the service that needed to be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Ms. Bogart. Dr. Block. Um, you do have in front of you our first monthly financial report, and I will briefly go over some areas with you so you understand because it does look a little different than what the one from the general fund is. Um, you will see um, the beginning fund balance that we started the year with was $418,600.15. And then you will see the revenues for each school. You have elementary school, 
middle school and high school. It's broken it down into what we have gotten so far from federal sources, which is your breakfast, lunch, and snack program. You'll see how each school is broken down the state sources, and that's the state salary supplement that we received. And then you'll see local sources, and that is adult meals and all car sales for the year so far. So those are going to show your revenues, and then you'll see your expenditures. Um, school nutrition is responsible for paying all bills generated, and how we do that is with the revenues that we receive, and that is all based on participation. If we don't have customers coming through, we're not going to generate funds. So we are able to pay our bills, and that's what we'd like to do, is always be able to support our program by the revenue that we generate through school meals. Um, you will see the salaries, benefits, um, water sewage, sanitation repairs, telephone, when we did have a telephone, that did come out. Now it's internet, so there's no charge. Um, USDA hauling. We receive money from USDA every year to purchase food, but to get it here, we have to pay an expense. And that is a travel fee that they charge us for every case that we receive. So there is an expenditure of that as well. Employee travel, um, supplies in the lunchroom, that's pencils, paper cups, ink, anything for school nutrition. Bananas, I know Ms. Opera loves her bananas. All those things come out of the school nutrition funds. So you will see that our total revenues so far this year have been $790,683.50 and our expenditures so far have been $698,812.28. Our ending fund balance is $654,058. Um, do you have any questions about that before I move forward? Do all of our children eat free at all the schools? Yes. They do eat free. Um, it is all based on the number of direct certified students we are able to identify during the school year. And every four years we have to reapply. So next year we're going to have to reapply and hope that our numbers are high enough that we can continue that. I think it's a great program. No, well, that's too high. Well, how's the numbers looking? I mean, we are going to show you our participation. We are very proud of what we see right now. And our participation in some areas are better than we expected. That's why you see a little bit more revenue than we were expecting in our budget. Um, we did want to show you what 2016, 17, and 18 looked like at each school level. You'll notice breaks were breakfast participation at Clatsdale Elementary School in 2016, I compared month to month, August through January, for all three years for breakfast and lunch. Currently, you'll see our breakfast participation in January was 54% for this year. Last year at this time, it was 74%, and in 2016, it was 58%. And you'll see our lunch participation this year in January, I about fell out of my chair when I did this, but it's 99% of elementary school for lunch. Last year, this time, it was 91%. And lunch in 2016, in January, was 94. <laughs> the decrease in um, the breakfast, is that due to the fact that we stopped eating in the classrooms at elementary school? You'll see in 2016, that was before Rex in the classroom. 2017 was when we started Rex in the classroom. 2018 shows you no Rex in the classroom. But did we implement something else to make it still available to them as they come in in the mornings? They have to go to the cafeteria. Kindergarten goes to the special class. I'm happy to discuss that this morning amongst ourselves in leadership meeting that we had at the stadium yesterday or this morning. We're going to ask that Ms. Blocker run another set of numbers for us, comparing hot meals versus cold oh, yeah. meal cereals. Mm -hmm. What we'd like to see, Dr. Blocker, when we send this to you, we want to see what those percentages are on hot meal days. It's a perception that we have, and we learn now we don't work on perception. We need that data back in. But we think our numbers are going to be fairly high on those hot meal days, whether you get the chicken biscuits or the sausage biscuits, pizza, breakfast pizza, those things. Mm -hmm. We want to see what that number is versus the bowl of cereal. It's 
not derogatory on anyone's part, but my kids, I think, have burned out on cereal in some cases mm -hmm. at breakfast meal. The majority of the meals last year in the breakfast in the classroom were those cold cereal meals. And they just they just sort of not eat them sometimes. So I think that's what we saw, what we thought was a decrease, but compared to that year before in 2016, the numbers are a few points mm -hmm. off. I think that's what the, the, we want to see what that issue is with hot meals. And then if it's more beneficial to feed them hot meals every day and get that number back up, that might be the answer. But we need more information. Dr. Block, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. I thought we entertained um, something in reference to a kiosk at the end of each hall. Or that, well, like that, that was a breakfast in the classroom. What, but Ms. Block, or Dr. Blocker and I actually were talking today. We recognize that, that changing the breakfast in the classroom was going to have an impact. We knew that. But the problem we ran into was a cleanliness issue and the staff. And again, Dr. Blocker's federal budgets have a very strict stipulation. So it's not like we can say, well, we'll take the extra revenue from school food service and we'll just hire more custodians. Mm -hmm. There's a set number on how she has to hire based on the participation <clears throat> rates. But we have been talking a couple of items we discussed today is after we get through GMAS testing, we're thinking about surveying, Mr. Midget, like you said, to determine which kids are eating at home, which kids are eating at school, and then which kids are not eating, which is the critical concern that we have. If there's a common characteristic of kids that are not eating at school or at home, we want to determine what it is and adjust our program accordingly. And we've talked about there are different school systems that schedule breakfast a little later in the morning after perhaps enrichment times, and those are things we're going to discuss this summer with our, with our leadership team. I think it's important, and I think Mr. Midget said that, I think it's important that we know specifically what is contributing to low participation. We want 100% of our kids to eat. But if 46% of our students are eating breakfast at home, we don't want them to eat breakfast at home and at school because, of course, if they don't have physical activity, we also want to contribute to obesity issues. I, I can attest to that. Um, it catches up with you later in life. So we do want to take a look at that. Um, but the reason we shared it in this format is to see that even based on these participation rates, we have a healthy program. We are operating in the black, and we are not necessarily losing money uh, from that standpoint. Mr. Midget, I do want to tell you, in 2016, we did have the choice of hot or cold breakfast mm -hmm. every day. And you'll see the participation rates were close to what they are now. Yeah. I thought it would be interesting to see Dr. Blocker. I mean, that's nothing, like I said, it's not a personal meal. It's just not, not derogatory. Mm -hmm. We just want to see what that, that number is and then just see if, if we can afford that. Maybe we do that more often. Would it be more beneficial? Okay. We just... And I would like to do that great survey that we talked about. We have, we have interns from Georgia Southern coming in and out constantly. And the last one that we had did a breakfast survey for students and for parents. And we're working on sending one out this week actually for parents that they can scan the, the code, the barcode, and actually do it. It's not a very long survey. We've sent it out on Facebook. We have 76 that have actually replied at this point from sending it out on Facebook. But lots of different suggestions. Some that we already knew. Some want breakfast in the classroom back. Some want us to do hot meals more often. Some want us to do different choices. So we're going to look at all these suggestions for next year and see how we can make it more successful, not just at elementary, but everywhere. Um, but again, this is elementary, and we're going to see what we can do to make that better. I don't know that we can make lunch much better. <laughs> I think we're doing a good job there. I found that one kid. <laughs> yeah. Okay, middle school. Um, you'll notice um, breakfast in 2016. You'll see the numbers. Um, 2017 is when we started Rex in the Classroom, and we have continued that this year, and the numbers have continued to grow. Is Dr. Holland still here? Dr. Holland hiding in the corner. <laughs> um, she does a good job of encouraging her students, and um, her staff are in the hallways every morning encouraging students to eat. Even the janitors are doing cheers, trying to get them to eat breakfast, and I've seen it works. I've been there, and I've seen it, so I'm very proud of that. Lunch also is good. You'll see the numbers there have continued to rise as well. High school, we started breakfast in the classroom in December of 2016. You'll notice where the numbers increased there. And um, 2017 continued and continued also this year. We're up to 68% this month. Lunch, um, I 
I have my theory, and I'm going to share it tonight. I think our participation there this year, you can see we're up to 93%. I think part of that is because of the tables that we have now. Uh, we saw immediately students eating more. Um, they're happier. They seem to be just so excited to come into that nice little cafeteria. And I think that has had a direct um, effect on our participation. I do want to commend um, Dr. Bielan. I have spent many days there lately. Uh, we've had a lot of illness in the cafeteria there. And everybody's so happy. <laughs> um, the kids are happy. And I just really enjoy being there. We've got a good DJ. Yeah, we have a good DJ. Yeah, it's been fun. So I went, you were at a meeting. Where's Mark Stroud? He was at a meeting. And I'm like, it's quiet. And everybody was kind of solemn. I said, we need our DJ back. But you've done a good job. And the kids are really, they're eating more. And I'm glad to see that because hungry children cannot learn. And we see that it's a success. And I'm proud of our staff. It's not me. It has nothing to do with me. It's all about the school nutrition staff and the hard jobs that they do every day. Any questions for Dr. Bowman? And I would tell you, on behalf of every kid in the district, their hot wings is the number one choice on the menu. <laughs> if they don't have hot wings, the kids complain. <laughs> I will tell the board that as part of the renovation project, we are working with Mr. Parker. Uh, we discussed this before, and this will kind of be rolled up into the project at the elementary school. We're taking a comprehensive look at the cafeteria. Um, as I remind everyone, when that school was built, that portion of the school was built for 600 students. The cafeteria area, nor the kitchen, have ever been expanded. Uh, and we're at a right at 1,039 uh, as of today. Those ladies make it work every day, um, but we've got to bring some additional fryers and upgrades of equipment. We're looking at some redesigns uh, on the serving line. Currently, we only have two serving lines. Uh, we're looking at a concept that would allow us to use the same personnel, but run five serving lines. Um, in doing so, we could feed about 150 kids in three minutes. And of course, we know in school that time is everything, and that time on instruction and time on task is very important. So we're looking at those concepts, how we can produce more and serve faster to get kids fed and then of course getting them back into class and capture some of that time for instructional. So we'll be bringing those updates again as soon as we meet with the construction manager to get through a timeline together for the project and then bring it to you for approval. Okay. You said 150 in three minutes. We serve, uh, Ms. Blocker said, or Dr. Blocker, I'm sorry I keep doing that. <laughs> it's just fine, yeah, it's okay. We, uh, she serves 11 Students. children per minute currently. So that's 22 kids uh, per minute per serving line. So when we look at that over five service lines at uh, 55 kids a minute, we get 100 and really 160 what all right, you math teachers, I'm sorry. We get over 150 kids through in three minutes. Um, okay. So that's two hours. We're running 1,039, 99% right for lunch. Yeah. Stay up. 1,035 kids through there in two hours You know, with the serving lines we got now. I mean, my hat's off there. Her work workers, it's insane to get them through there that quick. It's amazing that we get them through there. What time is it? It's 10.30. It's 10.30 and about 12.30. We've looked at the, the possibility with the additional serving lines that we might even could back lunch up to around 10.45. Because I'll be honest, 10.30 lunch is pretty early. Yeah, um, so we're looking at being able to possibly back that up and still be able to get the staff out. Of course, we've got the time restrictions too with our uh, staff that work seven hours a day. So we run into overtime if we're not careful with backing up too late. So they do a fantastic job when you think about it. Those ladies in the schools, uh, Dr. Blocker and, and the, the school nutrition program, feed 2,000 kids for the most part twice a day for the largest portion. You yeah, and uh, still have McDonald's had to do that. Whatever happened to the golden spatula? The golden we are working on that, trying to apply. Oh, you talking about the spatula? Oh, that's your thing. <laughs> we uh, we we haven't 
we've got a new health inspector. Oh. Um, and and I, I better I better leave it. Great great person, but new to the role, so you know it. Um, our ladies are doing a fantastic job. I, we do expect a hundred, but we have never been below I think a ninety seven. Um, at least my tenure here, so they do a tremendous job, not only serving, but, but doing it. But we hadn't quite hit that 100 mark again, and uh, we got to figure out something, though, because those ladies, I tell you, that was boom, 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 and it was all last year, and then I had to cook chicken, and, uh, which I enjoyed it. Steak, that's why we did steak uh, for a good day of the year. So, uh, hard working ladies do a great job. Any other comments there for Dr. Blocker? Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. If not, it is our recommendation the board approve the uh, consent agenda as presented. Okay. All right. I have a motion by Tara Powell. Do I have a second? By uh, Oak Terrace. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next would be new business for approval. Uh, we need to bring this to the board tonight. Two changes to the calendar. We actually adopted the calendar in December. Uh, the first was simply uh, a matter of information we didn't have because of football schedules. We need to make a motion that the board change um, the October 9th early release day for homecoming to October the 5th. That's the first change. The second change, uh, I have to apologize, it was an oversight on uh, my office. Uh, typically, uh, Martin, Luther King, we, Martin Luther King Day is the third weekend, but this year it was the second weekend only because we had five days in the month of January. I, the bottom line is I failed to look at the 2019 calendar. I misrepresented that holiday. It actually will be January the 21st. That is the national holiday. So we just want to change our adopted calendar to reflect um, the correct date. Any questions? If not, we recommend it. I um, received the email from Tara making the comment about how, you know, how we're the like third largest LK uh, group in the state, I believe. And so, uh, we're going to continue that. Right. And I apologize no, we'll for the oversight. Double no, we'll that. Thank you. All right. Uh, do I have a motion to accept uh, the calendar update? I have a motion by Sharon here. I have a second by Janelle Welch. All those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next new business to be uh, placed on the table. Uh, actually, if the board is okay, I'm going to address two and three, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Vandenberg to explain uh, number one and two. Every, um, is it every three years? Four. Every four years, uh, we're required to go through a federal audit uh, for our title programs. Uh, we are scheduled for April of this year uh, for our fourth uh, year for our review. As we go through this, it's not, off, not unusual, I should say, that uh, the federal government requires us to update policies that we have on particular items that deal with federal budgets. And what we've got tonight for you are two. These will be placed on the table, and uh, they'll sit there for a month. We'll ask for approval in March if there are no questions or comments. Uh, the first is policy EC. This is a new policy. This addresses the school property disposal procedures and disposition of equipment that are purchased specifically with federal funds. We have a disposition policy particularly that addresses capital assets, uh, but this is, this is a requirement for federal compliance, uh, and we've provided that verbiage for you tonight. Uh, Mr. Hallman has also reviewed this to make sure that we are in compliance with state and federal laws, so it is accurate as it's presented, but if you have questions, we do. Uh, would, would like to be able to entertain those for the board. The second policy is GAD. We currently have a professional learning opportunities policy. This is a revision, again, there was specific language that we needed to include. The federal government wants to see in district policies in regards to the opportunities for teachers for professional learning opportunities. I should say in the federal uh, uh, compliance that we have these in our policies to address how we will conduct business um, according to these two areas. So, are there any questions at this point that I possibly could address? Or if not, I'll be certainly available uh, if any arise. Okay. If not, uh, we are asking the board and placing on the table tonight for the board's consideration 
uh, a program called Measures of Academic Progress. It's typically abbreviated uh, and referred to as MAP. Uh, this is part of our instructional process. I'm going to ask Dr. Vandenberg to give you a brief overview tonight, but I do want to make sure, as I always share, uh, if the board uh, approves this recommendation that we're putting before you, it would require a $16,000 commitment this year. We're recommending that if it's approved, that would come out of the general fund. Uh, and we are asking that we, if at all possible, be able to do this March the 12th because we would like to implement it this year to be able to service uh, student needs beginning next academic year. So that's just a bit of an overview of the Dr. Benberg. I'll turn it over to you. Um. Right here, I want to start with to kind of give you some background and also to kind of set the reason how it came about that we need this academic program. And it is a type of an assessment program. Dr. Waters um, helped to create this visual, and we've been working with our Glissy consultant, Ms. Gail Hay, who's been coming into the district to help our principals with data impact checks as part of our school improvement process. And in some of our discussions with our school leadership, we've realized that sometimes people are not seeing the connection between our curriculum assessment and instruction PLCs and our guaranteed and viable curriculum cycle, which is also an assessment cycle. And when Dr. Waters and I were talking about it, we felt like we really wanted a graphic so that people could see that when we're talking about a CAI PLC or a GBC or even an assessment cycle, it's the same thing. It's the same process. And in that blue box, you have our learning outcomes. And for our teachers and leaders with the TLCs, this is where we are trying to set up what we want to accomplish as a school district. We want our students to be college and career ready. We want to make sure that every single graduate out of Evans County Schools has the knowledge and skills to either go into a college, whether that's a two-year or a four-year, or go into a career. So that's our goal, starting in pre-K all the way up. And when we look at there, we have set our school improvement goals and we have our school vision. And in our school improvement goals, our schools are looking very closely at their CCRPI data, their GMATS data, because that's a huge indicator for us, not just in accountability, but those are also the objectives to help us see, are we helping our students read where they need to read to be competitive in college and the workforce? Do they have the math, science, and social studies skills? Is there attendance where it needs to be? Are we helping our English learners, our students with disabilities? All those factors. So that's where our mountain is, our top. And as if you look over there on the green box, we have our curriculum. And of course, this is very dear to my heart. What is it that we want our students to know and do? That's our first question of our PLCs. We have to know what are the skills and what are the knowledge components. We have to know what our standards say. And our standards are not clear. They're written in education ease by educators and then state lawmakers and public also has their opportunity to put input into them. And then our teachers have to work in their teams to determine what does it mean? What do I need to teach my students? What do they need to know? And so they're doing this in their PLCs. And this year, a huge focus looking at those curriculum maps, making sure that we have mapped out our standards, that we've determined which ones are the most important, because we don't have time to teach all of them over and over and over again. So we have to put a standard on them. We have to put a measurement. And we determine our priority standards. We have our learning targets. We're aligning our DOK levels. And that's helping us map out our progressions on how we want the course to look. And that leads to that guaranteed and viable curriculum. If I have eight third grade teachers, I want every single student, regardless of which teacher, to have the same opportunity to be proficient in those standards. Next, we're moving into the assessment methods and progress monitoring. And as you know, last year in the spring, I came and I asked for some funding for Illuminate. Our teachers had expressed that they were not very comfortable in creating rigorous assessments, that they may know the standards, and they may know how to instruct those standards, but they're still a little sure on how do I assess to the level of the GMATs or to an AP exam or to a college entrance exam. And they've been using Illuminate this year in their building of common formative and summative assessments in their PLCs. As they finish their maps, the instructional coaches and I, and pulling in some lead teachers throughout the district, will be making those district benchmarks. We will implement in October and in February. And that's where we're going to take a temperature 
of every single course throughout the district to see are our children where we expected them to be. We're going to use Illuminate for that. We want it to model our GMAS assessments to help those children practice on those pieces. And this is where in analyzing our assessments, we realize that we have some really good common formative assessments that are being built by our teachers. We have some released items from the state. We have test item banks from USA Test Prep or from STAR or from Classworks. But in talking to our leaders with our impact checks, we don't have an assessment that tells us exactly where our students are, what they already know, and how much growth we can expect from those students in the next year. That is where the measurements of academic progress and the growth assessments come into play. In your information that I sent in your packets, <clears throat> I gave you that background, that we have some really good assessment data in our district, but that growth piece is critical. We've learned a lot about growth in our district with our CCRPI. We've learned that we need to expect typical and high growth for a child, but defining that is very hard to do. With math and their growth assessments, it's norm referenced. And not only in Georgia is this being used and being correlated very closely with the state assessments, but across the nation. The standards are aligned to our standards. They are our GSE. But those test items are norm referenced, and that's powerful because that's showing us that how our kids are performing compared to any child that's taking math. And it's also given us a projected growth. Often I hear in PLCs, how much Lexile level do you expect a child to gain in a year? Well, that's really a loaded question for me because there's a lot of variables that go into it. Children start with a certain amount of knowledge, and just because you're the same age or even in the same grade doesn't mean that I can expect this same amount of growth. That's where the math performance is very powerful because we'll be able to look and see where is that individual child and project growth. Then I need teachers to look at those growth reports and set goals for the children. If in a year we expect for you to be over here, where can I get you in December? And having those conversations of, this is where the data is telling us you can grow. It's not a pass, it's not a fail. It's this is a growth measurement. And we want you to grow. This is where you are, this is where we're going to get you, and this is how we're going to do it. And that's going to be those conversations and those PLCs as well. If we're going to grow our children, we have to make sure we're using those evidence-based instructional strategies. And so that's going to help push us into that next middle box of that instruction piece as well. But in order to be able to really fine-tune our instruction, we have to have an accurate assessment. We have to have something, and we have, as a leadership team, an instructional leadership team with principals and instructional coaches input, we have looked at the MAP growth assessments, and we feel like this measure will help us to set those growth targets. In looking at the MAP assessment, we also see that we can get our Lexile levels from there, from this one assessment. So we can give this assessment and get our Lexile levels as well. We will not need to do a STAR Lexile assessment or a STAR MATH assessment in the future. We'll be able to eliminate those. We don't want our children to be over-tested. We want to find high-quality assessments that give us more data and cause less time. Looking at the May administration, the principals and school leadership teams are already building their schedules. They'll present drafts to the district executive directors and Dr. Waters on Wednesday. It's just a draft, just where they think they may want to be. A lot of data will come in and influence the actual placement of the children, our GMAS data, our final G kids assessments their last common formative assessments, but also if we're able to administer MAP in May, we can use this data as another point. Go ahead and analyze and see where our data points on target with this one that we know is more reference. Then during the planning to be able to do proper professional learning with our teachers. MAP generates a ton of reports, but those reports are only going to be good if they're used. I need teachers to be able to be trained by the MAP, you know, publishing company representatives on how to analyze those reports and administrators at that time in order to make adjustments for your rosters for the next school year. 
Then we will look at doing an administration in August, December, <coughs> and May again to keep our cycle of benchmarking. In between the benchmarks, teachers will still continue to use Illuminate as well as USA Test Prep, any other common assessments they have created in their teams to help see if their students are working towards those growth goals and have those conversations. In the rest of my presentation, I just have some report <coughs> to show you. Um, MAP uses what is called a RIT scale, and it's a Roche unit scale. It will be the same scale for K through 12. <coughs> Sometimes when we have a lot of different assessments, we have different scales. And if the elementary school is using this assessment, and middle is using this one, and high is using this one, it's not wrong. But we have to have people that can talk the language of the assessments as the children move up. With the math, that RIT scale is the same. So when we see a 162, it does not matter if that child is in second grade or 12th grade. That 162 means the same thing. This chart here is showing you how you can track the growth over time with the MAP screener that would be given in K through 12. If you'll look at the next slide. This is a class breakdown report, and I don't really care if you can read the words. <laughs> because they're not really real people. They're made up people. But what I want you to see is that teachers, these are their children up here. And after a test is given, this would be the roster. So this is Ms. Peacock's class right here. And the reports go ahead and group them based on their levels on that RIT score. And so it's grouped her children for her already. That's differentiation. It's already analyzed their reports and grouped them. Then down here, it's going more into the actual lessons and skills that it would suggest that they do. So it's not just telling Ms. Peacock that when we look at your Algebra 1 students that they're four groups, it's saying this student needs help with numbers, and this one needs fractions, and this one needs decimals, and here's their groupings. So it's already breaking down the data, not just that you have a wide variety of levels, but it's taking it that next step into the standards. These are the specific domains that they're struggling in. You'll go to the next one. This is a student report, and it's a goal-setting worksheet. And it is huge. Efficacy in our business is huge. We have to believe that we can increase student achievement. They have to believe that they can increase. And with this sheet, what's powerful to me is that I can look at a child and say, according to this test, in the next year, I can get you to keep. Let's talk about how we're going to do that. What's going to happen? How is that going to happen? And having that efficacy that we can do this, it can happen. I got this printout, and it's official, and it shows exactly how we can do it. Go to the next one. This is a student growth report. It's an example of what would be sent home possibly to a parent. And it's actually aggregate by school, but it's just showing the data. Because there's parent <coughs> reports, there's teacher reports, there's student reports. And go to the next one. This is what I was talking about with map growth. That is our screener. That is the one we will use K-12. In talking with our RTI coordinators at our schools and with the administrators, class works at the elementary school and map, they blend. The students will not have to take a class works screener. We will import the map information into there. The map information also imports into Edgenuity. So our children at SEA, our children at Claxton High School that may be working on course recovery, we will take this data and put it into those programs. Classworks will still come up with the individual learning plan. SCA and CHS can still use Edgenuity and the MyPath interventions to help as well. But talking with middle and high school and their RTI needs, MAP growth has a MAP skills component. And this is taking that differentiation of groups and breaking it down. So the instructional area for this child is geometry. Now it's breaking it down into strands and into specific small lessons to help build up that student's um, achievement in math and ELA. And looking at planning for that next year, talking with Dr. Holland and her schedule, seeing about using it in the ELT classes to help support the student's tier two and tier three interventions. It's progress monitored, it's prescriptive, we can see the growth, we can monitor it very carefully, and it's small chunks. It's not a huge, overwhelming burden for a teacher to do. 
Also looking at it in the math support classes for the high school and the ELA remedials in ninth and 10th grade. Once again, drilling down to those skill gaps while the teachers still have time to work on standard achievement as well. So that's the math skills report that goes with it. And I think that's all my little screenshots. Okay. Dr. Pittsburgh, Ms. Hare actually asked this question. I, I think it's pertinent that we share this. And why are we looking at adding this when we have Illuminate? I think it's important to understand that they have two really distinct functions. When we look at our CCRPI goals, the scores from GMAS and those other areas, we're measured on students who have typical and high growth. Currently, Illuminate is measuring the standards and the questions teachers do. Think about your nine weeks exams, your chapter unit test things. That's what Illuminate is doing. What it will allow the teachers is basically, and Ms. Ockers with physical science, she can go in and create um, her assessment over elements, make sure they're at a DOK level three, which is moving into high growth and high rigor, and she can do constructive response, she can do uh, multiple choice, she can do free response, so it's more of a test bank generation. But once she gives it, it too will analyze. These kids were proficient in this standard, these kids need remediation, these kids were above. MAP is telling us that a child at a RIT score, and this one I will say is a 210, that correlates to a child's performance within that grade and what that typical high growth goal should be. So this child may have a RIT score of 210 in August or May, and their goal could be a RIT score of 290. That's the typical high growth. Within that, this does correlate with deficit skills that were possibly missed in earlier grades. That's the piece that will communicate with classworks and when these students are in support classes, whether it's EIP or extended learning time or support class at high school, this will allow us to customize some remediation and acceleration for kids. But I also want to make sure I make this perfectly clear. We're not asking to adopt computer programs to teach children the deficits they have. These are all tools that must be used in the hands of a master teacher to differentiate that classroom. And some ways that we've seen that, Ms. Peacock may have 18 kids, and for a period she may work in small groups with nine students on a specific skill. The other nine are working specifically in classworks to remediate or accelerate. That's what we're talking about in a practical sense. So, uh, very good question. I want to make sure that we clarify that. I hope that the did. Illuminate would be used in between your benchmarking of the map. If we did it in August and we did it in December, because we're checking to see how much growth, the teachers would use their Illuminate assessments that they created during PLC to keep monitoring student progress towards reaching that goal. Um, with map, it's norm referenced because of the millions of children that have taken it and they've been able to test the validity. With Illuminate, that's an assessment item bank that you're building with your team to assess your standard proficiency at a moment in time. So that Illuminate is more informative and this is more summative. And this is more of our growth measure too. That's, that's right. Illuminate doesn't that's have right. the capacity to be a growth measure. Now they have just rolled out a new report, but it's a growth measure on our assessments that we've done. And teachers can certainly do a pre and a post, but it's going to be a much smaller skill set. It's going to be over just those three standards that a teacher did on that assessment. Well, I was reading the information you gave me. Um, or gave us. I, I was I highlighted the part about Alexa level also being here because we spent so much time determining a child's Alexa level, and time is the most Precious. important thing you have. Thing, we same just thing can't eliminate you before yeah. we, when we did have eliminate. Uh -huh. Now, right. there we are. And I think we just put a price tag on this is the bottom line because mm -hmm. it's all about kids learning and, and how to assess where they are and mm -hmm. where to move them to. And I like the continuity so. of the uh, scale score or the net score because it goes across from kindergarten through 12 and I know in kindergarten one, one year we'd use one DRA and the next year we'd use something else and we had all these scores and we didn't know what they were. This way we're going to have continuity from K through 12 and we're going to know everybody's going to be on the same page. I did have a question you said the, te my, the note you gave us said that the teachers would have three days of professional learning so that that will be all teachers will get all teachers will receive training on how to use this. Yes. And how but it, will, it won't. I mean, the next question is, it's not going to be all teachers at one time. They're going to be enough that 
people that are slow on the computer like me. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious. There's some old teachers out there that I know. Not me, you know. The test administration, um, PL day as far as rolling out the test administration, that would probably not be all teachers. That's going to be like grade level to help, of course, our RTI coordinators, instructional coaches, and leaders because that would occur before May. But during, then during post planning, we're looking at half day sessions because that's about all your brain can take. It's a new topic. And doing groups of no more than 40 okay. over those two days and then doing another day in pre planning so that we can have new teachers or if somebody says, you know what, I just really need to hear it again. Mm -hmm. And that's analyzing the reports, understanding what you're looking at and what does it mean. And then the map skills teachers would also have a different training so that they'll understand how to implement that component into their classes. And I wasn't criticizing my friends. Some of us just, we didn't have computers until we were 35 years old. You know? and, and, and it takes us a lot longer than people who well, grew up. With and you computers. mentioned the time factor, Ms. Lockwood. And when I was talking to the MAP representative last week again about the details and finalizing the quotes, he said, How do you do your reading fluency? I said, well, they do demos, they do running records. I said, it's very time consuming. He said, we're rolling out in the fall a new map reading fluency in which the children read into a microphone on a computer. Whoa. So you take the children into the computer lab. Oh, did you? Oh, did you? <laughs> Terry, Terry, Terry can test how long <laughs> we went out in the hall. And she was in there. Can you not, Terry, how long it took us to do the yard? It takes weeks. It would take you probably to do a whole grade. At least a week. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was terrible. Depending on if your students and were all wasted time. instructional time, valuable instructional time. Well, and, and I'm glad you, you made the observation, Mr. Joyce. A couple of things that, that we see from the district level. One, I think you're right, it is invaluable that we have a consistent measure from pre K through 12th grade. Yeah. It's going to actually save us money on, in the long haul because principals are not having to purchase STAR or purchase other programs to determine different data indicators. The most difficult uh, process in the training for MAP is, is like Dr. Vandenberg said, is teaching teachers which reports are for which purpose. But once you're there, just to kind of give you an idea, this is the student report, the class report that she mentioned where they're already broken into groups. When their names are listed there, they will actually be in blue and a teacher simply clicks on the child's name and it drills down to that child. You just keep clicking and it drills down to the base level. So really, you'll know as a group how do they perform pretest. What should I expect growth? And, I, and this is the way I would equate it. And I don't mean to oversimplify, but it's almost like saying we have a deadline of April the first that everybody in this room is going to be in Atlanta on April the first at eight a.m. <laughs> the problem is if some of us are halfway around the world when we're starting. Some of us are starting in Savannah. Some of us are starting in Lithonia. Some of us are starting at uh, Macon. The reality, though, the state assessment GMAS doesn't take into account any of that. When you take a third grade GMAS, you're supposed to be at this point, at this date and time, when they take the assessment. Unfortunately, in education, we have beat up on teachers when we don't meet that goal, but yet you look at student growth and they've grown two grade levels. That's what we want to do is to reaffirm not only for our teachers, but our, for our students that you are showing tremendous growth. And that is powerful. The other piece, and again this gets a little bit farther in the weeds, is this can be converted into a teacher conference document to sit down with a parent and they say, I don't know how to help my child in algebra. And you can say, Mom, I really don't need you to worry about algebra. What I need you to work on are multiplication tables or converting fractions to decimals specific pieces that undergird the learning that parents will feel comfortable with but as I've told folks before I did fine with math and I did fine with spelling when they mix the two I started having trouble um, that's algebra a lot of people may not even realize we had this long conversation today too sometimes what the state requires us to do is well above and beyond what is necessary for children to be successful in college and career. And I say that, it's not bad to overshoot because our kids are capable. But our kids have to take algebra two in high school. That's a college, that's a graduation requirement. 90% of the students that go to Georgia Southern or other colleges don't take anything higher than algebra one. 
unless they're going to be a math teacher or an engineer. And we've got to be prepared for that, but all of our children are required to do that. So we need to make sure we're able to articulate what their growth should be and how we can support that. So we feel very strongly that this will be a very powerful tool in the toolbox for the district of our teachers. Okay. Board, have any questions? Dr. Van Berg, great job. Thank Appreciate you. that. Your name is very clear from your handout. You know, that it's definitely <laughs> worthwhile. I'm not that slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so I have a motion. Is it action on the uh, No, sir. It's on the table. Okay. Yes, sir. And we'll, we'll call that for action in uh, March. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, next is executive session. Uh, Ron, you have anything? Okay. All right, uh, to discuss or deliberate upon the appointment, employment, compensation, hiring, disciplinary action, or dismissal of periodic evaluation, or random of public officer employees. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? I have a motion by Sharon Aaron, second by Ed Mosley. All those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? We're now in executive session. We'll be back. Maybe. <laughs>